I'm Isabella and you're listening to Zeno. Each month I have conversations with people from all walks of life about their personal stories of home, identity and the search for belonging. Supriya, I'm so happy to have you in the studio today. I've been really excited to speak with you and it was so amazing to have you like reach out to me as well and, and to have this conversation. Yeah, this is exciting. <laughs> and for those uh, of listeners who don't know your work or are not familiar with you, how do you describe yourself and, and the work that you do? I do a lot of ki- different kinds of writing, but uh, primarily I am a poet. and i feel like other forms of writing also stem from a practice my creative practice as a poet so i'm a poet and what kind of poet i feel like i sort of write as i live my life as life goes on the different events that take place in it and everything but my work is rooted in a sense of history and belonging and that's the lens through which i look at the world yeah beautiful And uh, as we spoke earlier, I, I came across your work through uh, The Yak Dilemma. I had the serendipity of coming across the work in a bookshop in Peckham. Shout out to Review Books. <laughs> And I, I was immediately drawn to your book because the motif of the map as well, like this, and, and I've read that the design for the book, when you were collaborating with the artist, it's... a kind of mishmash of of Ireland and India put together and and so kind of this idea of um making your own map of where you belong and i found that so interesting and it was so hard to decide which poems i would love to hear you read because er- almost every single one i i found quite resonant but at the same time it's so rooted in your personal experience and i think that's so magical how do you answer the question where are you from and when you give that answer what truths are missing i think about that a lot and i feel like i have given different answers at different points of my life and the answer where i am at right now is rooted in landscape rather than a place so if someone asks me what home for me is or where am i from where am i originally from i always say i'm from the mountains mm. because i was born in a town which is in the foothills of the Himalayas in North India. And yeah, I feel like I've started to associate with that landscape now. And the truths that are missing from this answer correspond with different identities that exist there. So my family is not from there in the town where I was born. Uh, my... dad moved there for work years ago decades ago and he's sort of always been there and i was born there so yeah that is sort of the reality for me but um, both my parents families from punjab a neighboring state and we come from like all our ancestors come from punjab We are at the crossroads there in a way. We are so close to Punjab when we are in Palampur, the town where I was born, but we are not in Punjab. I went to school in um, Palampur and I was always the only Punjabi kid in my class and you know things like that. So, I asked certain questions about identity from very early on and I feel like I've looked at it from a child's lens a poet's lens an adult's lens and we're living in weird political climate so i think about it in different ways now so it has always existed for me that dichotomy has always existed for me wow i love what you're saying about that now you kind of see your belonging as as rooted in landscape um rather than simply place i think that's so interesting and that's a theme that recurs in in the act dilemma and focusing on the act dilemma just because it touches on so many of these different themes what context about you and your life is important for us to understand the act dilemma i think not being able to settle in one place is one but also i feel like language is is a very integral to so many poems in the act dilemma and I heard this the other day and it really made me think. A poet said that poetry was their mother tongue 
Mm. And I think that was so interesting because I feel like I've always, my mother tongue, so to say, but the rule of the book is Punjabi. And, uh, but my relationship to Punjabi has been so skewed. My relationship to every language has been, I feel like I'm not comfortable at calling any language my mother tongue, really, because I've sort of like grew up between different languages. I think I was closest to English. That's the language I've chosen to write poems in. And that's the primary language that I work with. So I think language and that sort of misplacement rather than displacement geographically is very integral to the poems in the Yacht Beautiful. And I think on that note, I would love you to read Meet Me in the Morning on No Man's Land. Yeah, I would love to read that one. Meet me in the morning on no man's land. Meet me in the morning on no man's land where there are no magpies, no ravens, no candles, no kettles, no cups, no saucers, no sun, no moon, no light, no darkness. Yet it is morning, but mornings on no man's land are different from the casual mornings we wake up to. Meet me in the morning where heads float and so do our hearts. Where there is no gravity and the only thing that keeps us grounded is the fact that we are together and it is that time of the morning. Meet me in the morning when I will whisper those floating words into your ears. Words that will float in the air but you will float to catch them and I will end up chasing you. Floating like those bubbles in the beer we drank last night. Meet me in the morning on no man's land where skins lose their color, where we are not white nor brown or black, but just the shade of a most loved color. I will be lilac and you can be that shade of yellow you like. Everyone will qualify to be a person of color. Meet me in the morning and come as the image of an image I have of you, hand over hand, knee over knee. In that bleeding memory, our bodies, our countries, we trespass to walk from yes to yes. You convince me if we can substitute an ampersand for a comma, then it belongs there. Meet me in the morning on no man's land. We will create a daisy chain of ampersands on no man's land. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful. What, Supriya, are your earliest memories of feeling like an outsider or feeling different? When I remember back in school, back when I was in primary school, this is a very early memory. I come from a sick family. My dad wears a turban. And uh, I was the only sick student in my school. We were a minority in the school. So sometimes, you know, my dad would come to drop me at the school in the morning and everyone in my class would sort of like come to the windows to see him, just a person with a different appearance. And uh, yeah, so that really made me think from a very early stage that I was different, that my family was different. In what ways? I didn't understand that at that point. But I feel like I have thought about my community, about people from Punjab in a lot of ways since then. Wow, that's so that's so powerful. And it's such a contrast as well, because as children, you, they don't understand. They carry the, the beliefs of their parents so often at that age. And, you know, this, the turban, the Sikh turban is such a sign of courage and responsibility yeah. it's such a meaningful yeah. symbol yep and the act of putting the turban on in the morning and the fact that sometimes as i hear from people it's painful to put it on but it's a daily practice and it's yeah. a reminder of your role and your responsibility and yeah for children to kind of look upon that in a negative way it's doubly painful i find yeah, and I feel like so much that is visibly wrong in a society, we are exposed to it from very early on in our lives. But I feel like 
we just understand it in so many different ways when we as we age there's another instance that has stayed with me i think i was what 10 years old and one of those uh, uh moments again when my dad was i don't remember whether he was dropping me or picking me up but he was wearing a green turban that day and next day uh, a group of uh, children from my class asked me that why was your dad wearing a green turban i was like what's wrong with green greens greens lovely like mm. greens great they were like greens actually the color for muslims greens the color for islam so why is your dad wearing a green turban but for children who were 10 to think that way and you know i had no answer to that and i remember coming home and conveying this to my parents they were surprised they had never thought of it like that they were so shocked that is shocking there is islamophobia at play there i would say but like from such an early age which is Absolutely. shocking we well, touch a lot on um language and the importance of it i loved the references to language in in the yak dilemma i love arabic lessons and i in a previous conversation i've had on the podcast i talk about how language is more than just a status symbol it's a tool to assert your belonging and you know, being a poet and a writer an artist you you use language in such a way to kind of assert that i'd love to know what languages have you found home in i feel like i've always come back to english i think english has sort of been my anchor because it's a language in which i express myself it's a language that i've chosen to express myself in and my parents at home always spoke punjabi so I always knew how to talk in Punjabi how to respond in Punjabi but uh, I came to the script much later in my life I learned it on my own because there was always a Punjabi newspaper coming at house there was always like you know Punjabi news channels and things like that so I picked it up on my own but sort of much later in life I have no formal training in learning it in school or anything like that so I feel like my teenage years were spent understanding looking at punjabi on paper and just grasping it in a different way and then hindi has always been around because i grew up in palampur and people mostly speak hindi there and it was taught at school as well so it it's also one of those languages that's always been around me but i feel like my loyalty is really with punjabi and the older i get the closer i feel to punjabi more than any language and i've recently started to read in punjabi a lot poetry fiction etc etc and there are some things that which have which have spoken to me in in just very surreal ways and i'm sort of a newbie translator and i really want people in english language world to know those stories to know those narratives i'm at work at translating a few texts a few stories as of now into english and but i feel like the act of translation is so intimate like i'm doing it as a task i'm doing it as a job that i've allotted to myself but i feel like it's such an intimate act it really you sort of like playing with these two voices in your head and one voice sometimes dominates the other and it's a playful act of sorts and it's also helping me reevaluate my language with english english and punjabi both i'm enjoying it that's beautiful it sounds intimate as well because you are unveiling the meaning of what's being said to a different audience a different yeah. um a different culture yeah you're also sort of like playing with the voice and tone and i don't know a lot about translation i know as much as a literature student does i'm still learning i i have very less practice based experience since i've just started out to do this but i feel like it's such a game you play you can play it playing by the rules you can very much play by the rules and just stick to that model of it or you can make your own rules there's a lot of room for exp- uh, experimentation there yeah it's like an art form yeah. in itself yeah yeah i yeah. i do love it when um when you read a text that's been translated and and there are translators footnotes where they express yeah, yeah. you know this is 
this is why yeah. I've done this. Yeah. And it's beautiful because you're in conversation with the author yeah. and yeah. with the reader at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's exciting. And a lot of writers that have excited me in my own creative practice, I've read them in English, but they've always written in other languages. So I feel like we should, we, this is one aspect of literature that we cannot overlook. I think if anyone speaks more than one language, they should never forget that this is essential translations, essential to our understanding of the world, literature and so on. Do you think it's becoming more important? Yeah, yeah, definitely. What are you grappling with at the moment in terms of uh, translation? I mean, you mentioned you're looking at works in Punjabi. What in particular are you grappling with? It's interesting. So I'm translating two stories at the moment. They're both by the same author. One of them I like more than the other. So I'm using the other story that I like less as an exercise to do the to do justice to the other story. But the main character in the story that I love very much sort of like transcends boundaries, borders, language, and so much. But I'll be honest what it made me feel like. I've read many, many, many stories, many novels growing up as a literature student and as a creative practitioner. But I feel like there had not been a story until this one in which I, th I felt like the main character resonated with my father. And be because of the man that my father is, you know, Punjabi speaking, sick man, scientist, blah, blah, blah. You know, just I, I feel like culturally this was just like so on point. I had then not experienced this before. It, so was it the first time that you kind of saw such a big part of your life on the page in a way? Yeah, and it felt very close to my life. That's wonderful. Um, I'm I'm excited to hopefully see the work that comes out yeah. of that. And what a beautiful role to be in to translate that experience to another audience. Yeah, I'm sure how I have felt, there are so many other people who will feel the similar way. You mentioned this feeling of transcendence and I think it's so closely connected with language. You know, your, it, language enables you to transcend experience. So, you know, having having become so um, intimately connected with Hindi and English and Punjabi, you're able to kind of communicate that experience and also understand others who might not know anything about where you're from or, or what your own experience is. I loved Arabic lessons in particular, um, and I think I'd love to hear you read that yeah, before. I would, I would love to read that one. Arabic lessons. Aslam alaikum. Peace be upon you, walaikum aslam, and peace be upon you too. We were ten strangers scattered in a seminar room in a university in Belfast. Our teacher asked us, why were we there? I said I grew up in India around people who spoke Urdu fluently and thought I might be able to pick up Arabic quickly. You know, it is that sort of thing. I want to read Mahmoud Darwish's poetry in his mother tongue and live in Beirut, Cairo, Kuwait without having to bargain for chandeliers or dates, without letting anyone know I am a foreigner. So you are not a journalist? No, I am a poet. How long have you lived in Northern Ireland? A few months. He laughed. For ten weeks, ten of us sat once a week in the same seminar room, waiting for Arabic to come to us naturally. Masalama, goodbye. Nothing came more naturally than the phrase for bidding farewell, our minds ready to depart wherever we had come from. Masalama. Shukran. I absolutely love this. This made me think of so many things and I... I feel there's something so magical about coming to a space with the intention to understand a different culture. Mm. A while ago, I was also interested in learning Arabic and, and started lessons and it's such an insane language and yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And as you mentioned in the poem, it opens you up to su such rich cultural heritage, yeah. you know, like literature, mm. so many amazing works. And I just want to kind of explore that feeling of not wanting to feel like a foreigner 
and wanting to come to a place like, like you mentioned Kuwait and and wanting to be able to yeah. haggle for <laughs> for things in the market and doing that with the fluidity why do you think it's important to seek that that feeling just for the full experience of it i feel like uh before i started arabic lessons i spent some time in egypt uh, the same year and uh I don't know. I have always been very inclined towards Arabic as language, but when I was in Egypt, I think I was that was the closest I ever got to it physically, geographically. And I came back to Belfast. I was living in Belfast when I went to Egypt and I came back to Belfast with the richness of sounds and you know and I was at a poetry festival in Egypt with all those poems and I I I felt like you know I was at a loss there because I couldn't like understand it the way I wanted to. So I really wanted to make the extra effort to grasp the full essence of it. So yeah, I think just for the full experience of it i would say i've always loved mahmoud darwish's poems and i but i've read them in english i think it's learning arabic is going to be such a slow process and maybe here is here a labor of love <laughs> and if i'm consistent enough i can get there one day it will it really mean a lot to me yeah absolutely the, co- the commitment to it and that first poem that you read it's going to be a magical moment <laughs> I've often seek that same feeling. I speak Italian and so I speak Spanish and I recently picked up Arab while well, trying to pick up Arabic and French. It's almost like a drug really. Like you yeah. can't at once you get that feeling yeah. of surprising someone uh, when you order coffee in the morning or surprising someone with your knowledge of that country's cultural heritage yeah. you mention uh, Edward Said in in the yeah. in the Yak Dilemma dropping that it's like yeah. it's like wow this person really knows what they're talking about <laughs> yeah i've read recently but i was reading about like a, a psychology book um and it mentioned that therapists often go into that work because they want to understand the understandable mm-hmm. and talking about a different subject but i that's exactly what it felt like it's like you you want to understand the understandable yeah. and there's so much in society and in our global politics that is for some reason seemingly rendered misunderstood yeah 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 largely yeah i think i'll think about this a lot understanding the understandable because it resonates with so many poems as well it's often said that you're sort of rewriting the one poem you actually want to write but you're not getting there so you're just like <laughs> rewriting the same draft over and over again and i think that's similar to understanding different cultures as well you know, you're trying to understand the same thing in different ways until you actually come around to understand it mm, exactly and um through that process you understand more of yourself yeah yeah and i loved as well there are some of the descriptions of the act dilemma i think someone wrote that it was like you were like an intrepid flaneur <laughs> or flaneurs and i i loved that description of it i thought it was so poignant it reminded me a lot of the idea of uh, psychogeography so it's connected to the flaneur so uh, psychogeography essentially was a kind of a marxist theory okay um from this uh theorist called Guy Debord in 1955 and he was part of the situationist movement and it was inspired by Charles Baudelaire's um f- uh, right. flaneur right okay okay um, and okay. it's the idea that physical space and and place has an impact on the psyche and um in an experimental practice uh, like a flaneur you and um Uh, you just kind of wonder yeah. where your your desire takes you and and allow yeah. the space to um mm. impact you and i felt that very much reading the act dilemma particularly when you're exploring cairo when you're exploring yeah. turkey it's that feeling of just moving through space and exploring a uh, culture and allowing yourself to find small moments of connection and belonging yeah. like yeah. the the um, I'm reminded of the conversation you have with someone in a hotel and yeah. the the waiter and yeah. you know these small yeah. moments of yeah. connection. That's very interesting that you mentioned that and I feel like all my poems in this book are about those little moments 
Like for a very long time, I was just obsessed with watching chefs take cigarette breaks in different cities because <laughs> I feel like there was something to be grasped there. <laughs> and then it, I stopped when the lockdown happened during the pandemic. I just couldn't do that, and it really got to me. So I feel like you know that's sort of what my creative practice actually stems from. Just like watching, rewatching. the same things in different parts making a connection and are trying to establish a connection yeah those um transient moments of uh being understood by someone who is in a different yeah. place to you yeah about the little things and um a lot of the act dilemma touches on the theme of exile and i wanted to know what does exile mean to you I think my first and foremost understanding of exile came from the understanding of partition of Punjab and West Punjab, East Punjab, Pakistan, India. Growing up, it was always there. That subject was always there and I personally started exploring that subject more when uh Brexit was announced and during that same time I wrote meet me in the morning on no man's land thinking about Brexit partition and everything but like I feel like you know we are still there the war in Ukraine and the way the world is right now we are remotely not even at a position close to where we can stop thinking about exile exile is defining our lives and it it has always done so in different forms i often think about personal narratives and narratives that are being carried on from one generation to another the stories the objects there's so much there there's so much there that we have retained but there's most of it we have lost and i don't even know that writing these poems is a homage to what what we have retained or what we have lost but I think it's kind of both. When you say uh, there's something lost is that lost in the mere movement or violence or what is it what's causing the loss? Violence mostly, yeah. It's not just stories that we are losing. We're losing people have lost lives and I feel like that violence has come at a very high cost and it continues to exist that way and really makes me very unsettled. You mentioned the ongoing conflict um between Pakistan and India and you mentioned in the act dilemma as well uh, Kashmir and mm-hmm. and that conflict that has been going on for so long and yet there has not seemingly been a moment of mutual understanding mm-hmm. and dialogue. Yeah. I feel like our governments have pushed us into a hole where we are constantly made to believe living where we live that there's so much hate around us but i feel like real human connection just transcends that hate very easily when i was growing up in india a pakistani person felt really really far away it felt like you know you that world felt really far away but then you come here and you meet people from all walks of life and you understand each other better and so much of what was being taught to you was so wrong and yeah borders are overrated mm-hmm. yeah they're very overrated C- conclusion conclusion <laughs> and yeah a lot of poems in the book that's a lot about borders and connecting with people from everywhere you you mention Urdu as well like yeah. learning Urdu what's your relationship to to that i think urdu's always been around because i grew up in north india so it had always been around me and i sort of have a similar relationship with urdu as i have with punjabi that i was i didn't like f- learn it formally in school but it was always around so sort of like picked up and i feel like Urdu is a language of uh, music and poetry primarily in North India like yeah a lot of poets that you should be reading are in Urdu a lot of music you should be listening to a lot of ghazals you should be listening to are in Urdu so yeah it's sort of like has always been around mm, i can imagine that must it must be quite formative for you as well becoming a poet and a creator 
in northern India. Yeah, the cadence of it, I would say, like, you know, I love listening to ghazals, like, I, and it's sort of a meditative experience for me, just zoning out, listening to a ghazal. Since it had always been around, it, I, I feel like it doesn't receive proper acknowledgement, but uh, it, do, it does have, like, a significant role to play. Is there a particular kind of theme that they touch on that you've you've been really drawn to? I think longing, a spiritual longing of sorts. And I feel like you understand it differently at different points of life. It's very intuitive, meditative for me to engage with that. Yeah, that's normally such a sign of a masterpiece when yeah. you look at it at different yeah. points in your life and it has a different resonance. Exactly, yeah, it's sort of... It's timeless. And you've moved around a lot. You were mentioning to me earlier so that you grew up in Palampur, right? And studied in Ireland. Yeah, Dublin, Belfast. Dublin yeah. and Belfast. And, and then you came to London. Yeah. And now you find yourself back in Palampur. Yeah. 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 What has your relationship to the mountains been like as of late? Uh, yeah, it's been a very complicated relationship because when you're just thrown into such a beautiful place and you're just born in such a beautiful place, it's so hard for you to understand what to make of that beauty. So growing up, you, you're sort of still learning to like it, dislike it or whatever. But ever since the pandemic, the structure of our lives has changed so much. We spent so much time just enclosed in four walls of our respective rooms, wherever in the world we were, that our relationship to nature changed. And I feel more closer to nature in the last two years. I've spent largely in Palampur, in the landscape of Palampur, than ever. And I feel like even if I'm not out and about, like, you know, even if I'm I'm not taking that walk or if I'm not climbing that mountain. Just the act of looking at a mountain changed so much for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's scientifically proven just just looking at a mountain <laughs> is going to be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and being close to something so beautiful, it changes you. Yeah, it's a hard relationship with beauty. Like, what do you do with so much beauty? beauty, natural beauty around you. But I also feel like my relationship with nature has changed in a way that I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that I grew up in Palampur and I'm in Palampur now. But how the climate there has changed. I mean, we had a heat wave this June and it was insane. Wow. I felt like it was the longest summer of my life because I, when I was in home in June, it was the hottest summer ever there. I came here in July. We had a heat wave here in London. And then I went back and it was still summer back home. It was insane, but it's also very sad. It's like, I don't know, when you were growing up, you would wear jumpers in July after a really good night of rain. And now the jumper weather doesn't come till November. And it's a drastic change. And I think that's also like changing the way... The trees look, the changing the habits of animals and little things. But these sort of things, because you have not spent time there over the last decade or so, and now you're back there again, it's it's a it's very hard to understand it, and it's very unsettling to see that change happening. So even or or I feel it that way because I feel closer to nature now than I did as a child. So if I take that change very personally, as we all should. But yeah, it, it's very heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. The impact of of climate change it's so painful to really contemplate it and yeah. to have to see it happening somewhere so close to your heart. Yeah, right before yeah. your eyes. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that you say your relationship to nature has changed in the last few years. I really feel the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So I, I grew up in London and I've been in the city for a while. My partner and I recently moved back out to the countryside where I grew up. And I'm rediscovering how grounded you can feel knowing a landscape. And I've been doing a lot of like hiking and 
walking and this sort of thing and just trying to understand uh, the nature that surrounds us and the landscape and similarly I, I you know I grew up there I was yeah. surrounded by these spaces yeah. as a child and I have no memory of yeah. of it as a child and yeah. I think part of that is as children you are naturally more egocentric yeah. um, because yeah. you're focusing yeah. on your own sense of self yeah. and building that yeah. relationship to others and navigating mm. friendships yeah. and this sort of thing and part of it as well is when you're young you just want to be in the city and yeah. partying and all this nonsense <laughs> yeah. and like being cool and yeah, yeah. sort of wearing... a sense of running away is yeah there. and uh, it couldn't be so far from how I feel now but there's something I mean ultimately uh, I believe for a more sustainable sense of identity we do need to all return to that connectedness with nature yeah. uh, and one person who's uh, really uh, I've been quite inspired by in their work is Ruth Allen. She's an author, but she's also a psychotherapist and she focuses on ecotherapy. Mm-hmm. And it's the idea of uh, understanding yourself by in- interacting with nature. Yeah. And I've been exploring that personally. How can I feel more grounded in my identity and, and sense of self um, yeah. in relationship to nature? Yeah, it's very interesting. I've thought about that a lot, how to understand that aspect of my connection with nature better and how to I, I sometimes try to think how will it be like you know in the years to come because it's seen so much in the last few years how will it change in the future and things like that and I don't have many skills but I just love to walk you could ask me to walk anywhere and I would do it so walking's been one act that I have been engaging myself in without any agenda a sort of intuitive walk of kind and and there's so many writers who have walked so much and written so much about walking and i i really in even if it's not not in the nature even if in the urban sense but i think it's it's so important it's connecting again to that flaneur flaneur's um yeah. concept and it's scientifically proven that the act of walking and and the simple act of being grounded in in that act um without an agenda is beneficial for us mm. even urban spaces it yeah. can be beneficial so um i'd love for you if possible to read uh, no one wants to think of marigolds in september oh that's a london poem i like that one <laughs> No one wants to think of marigolds in September. Most passengers who alighted from the train walked into the other direction as I sheltered myself from the rain and the hullabaloo of the pre-autumnal madness, the pumpkin spice pleasures in Starbucks, the squawking of birds preparing for winter migration, and the busker seeking validation for his terrible cover of Bowie's space oddity. Near the red light at the intersection with Moorgate Street, a young man handed me a flyer for two-for-one cocktails in a nearby pub, which was called the Swan and Hoop, once upon a time, where Keats was born. These immortal poets are unthinkable in London rain, except in the vicinity of the houses that mark their birth or death, where their pain and delight become products of our imagination. While I got lured by a flyer advertising day drinking with Keats's ghost, somebody tripped over a bed of soggy marigold petals, certain that they offered no sense of harm. It was September, after all, when flowers, even the ones without a murky past, like lifeless nomads, belong only to the ground. Thank you. This is definitely one of my favorites. <laughs> It's so beautiful, the imagery and marigolds too. I mean, I just recently came back from Nepal and I had the pleasure of being there for uh, Diwali and Tihar. And the marigolds are are just so beautiful. Yeah, in in my head, I always associate marigolds with Diwali. Like not even in my most distant dreams, I would think of associating marigolds with London. So the scene that's depicted here, you know, soggy marigold petals lying on the crown, that's that stands out like in my memory. And you know, I really, well, when I was writing in in uh, writing this poem, I really wanted 
to reflect that movement in all its uniqueness. So yeah, but that's what and uh, naturally comes to me as well, the sight of marigolds and thinking of Diwali and yeah, the brightness of it. It, uh, it it gives me shivers really, um, in a good way. <laughs> Because marigolds, uh, not only are they just striking mm. visually, but they have so much significance. Yeah. And yeah. as you mentioned, it relates to Diwali and it's such a point of connection, yeah. time with loved ones, yeah. celebration. Yeah. The warmth, yeah. The warmth. Yeah. And, and they're also very versatile. They're sort of like, are very easy to grow. They're a gift. <laughs> they are a gift, yeah. And the contrast as well of... <laughs> pumpkin spice pleasures and people selling you day drinking and talk to me a bit about your experience living in London and your relationship with loneliness. I am an only child so I feel like I've always tackled with loneliness quite well. I feel like it has morphed into solitude quite easily for me. That's something that's that that is my natural environment of sorts but i've never lived in london for a very long amount of time i spent significant amount of time in dublin in belfast in palimper in shimla where i went for my undergrad i've always been in and out of london because i've always had work to do here i've come here lived for a certain amount of months always like gone back to some other city so it's always been touch and go but i really really love the city I don't know. I do quite well with my loneliness when I'm here, which might not be the case everywhere in the world. I don't think I do well with loneliness when I'm in Palimpur. I think I'm better at living with my loneliness in London. And it it really means a lot to me because I don't get the same sense in most cities. That's interesting. Have you pinpointed why that might be that you are in a more healthy relationship with loneliness or solitude when you're here? I think there's no reason for it. Sometimes you just have a relationship with the place and something that just happens naturally without you putting in a conscious effort or something like that. So it's like I think my experience with London stems from that mostly. Also, like atmosphere of of place, like going back to like the concept of psychogeography, like the physical space itself has an energy to it, and it has um, yeah. history and memory. Yeah, and yeah. I tend to feel that way in New York for some reason. Yeah, like, that's I, a, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I can. I'm similar to what you said about you yeah. feel you're better in relationship with loneliness here. I I can let myself fall into the the iconic atmosphere of New York and that being that I'm just a, a single person walking down the street at night in New York and people are shouting at each other and there's yeah. <laughs> the yeah. taxis are going past there's something about the iconic nature of it um, or cinematic something about that I felt something similar in Istanbul as well and I just like took a city break and went there when I went there for the first time but I think there was something about my experiences in the West, living in the West, and my experiences of growing up in India, that found a middle ground in Istanbul. And that's just because of how the city is in its element. But I kind of feel similarly in London. I can be the person I choose to be here. There's not a part of me that dominates me. I can like really... I feel like I feel like you know when you grow up with so many different languages and you've lived in so many places there's so many aspects to your personality and I can let the one I want to dominate here rather than the natural circumstances dominating a part of my personality. Well, I couldn't that's just so so poignant. Yeah, this language of parts as well that there there are many parts of you, many parts of your identity that you have gathered and developed over your life's experience yeah. and having interacted in yeah. different places. There's nothing worse than being in a place where one maybe small aspect of your identity is dominated. Yeah. It becomes the dominant narrative yeah. and it's not your own. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's what someone else has decided exactly. is your narrative. What does home taste, sound and smell like for you? When there are pine needles scattered on the ground and it has just rained and that smell, that's the scent of pine wood, very fresh. 
pine needles soaked in water. That's what home smells like for me because that's what Palampur smells like. And taste, oh my god. I lost my mother some time ago and ever since my mom's passing, my relationship with food has changed a lot. And there are certain kind of foods I've not been able to go back to because they won't taste the same like the way my mother makes them or how would that kind of food taste in her presence as well but uh, uh do you know what sag yes yeah so i feel like the sag that's made here or even in a lot of parts of india is they use only one kind of leaves like mainly mainly spinach leaves or something like that but i feel the sag that's made in punjab is just a cocktail made from a cocktail of leaves of different <laughs> kinds and to get that right flavor to get that right balance of mustard leaves spinach and all the other thing it's so hard and people in punjab really do that so well <laughs> eat your greens but eat your greens the punjab way i would say <laughs> and i think my mom really did it very well and that's what home tastes like for me like it's a winter afternoon and there's like freshly prepared sag not bitter not sweet just the right flavor right balance and yeah delicious yeah <laughs> i i will have to travel all the way to punjab for that <laughs> and uh sound sound uh water gushing against stones after a really heavy night of rain yeah that's the sound of home beautiful now i'd love you to read my favorite poem from the eclema trading himalayan saffron for homesickness trading himalayan saffron for homesickness it will take us 50 minutes to reach the nearest airport mom will insist that us sit in the front seat dad will drive We will try our best to take care of the small talk business. My eyes will twitch with a tear or two, like the wick that is not the correct size for the candle. The winter silverware on the hills won't have corroded yet. It could take me from 6 months to a year to make the journey back. I know mom will have secretly packed enough saffron for me to last a lifetime. Yet she will say Take some more kesar for the road. We don't know when we will see you next. Thank you. How has your relationship to your sense of belonging changed since your mum's passing? When some things a person's taken out of your life like that, there's a void. and you try to fill that void with all the memories that person gave you or anything that had to do with that person and i feel like with my mom i think i really have inherited the love for language and the intelligence of using that language and always thinking about the right words and always thinking about how you could sort of evolve your relationship with the language with punjabi in this case so that's the gift i got from my mother the gift of language and the gift of punjabi and i sort of don't want to lose it and that's why i feel closer to the language now than i did ever in my life i sort of think about that a lot and i want to preserve it i love your imagery in the poem as well it's something almost universal it's like You, know, you you leave home and your mom's like take take all these spices yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i literally just you know my family live in italy and i recently left and i got given sacks and sacks of turmeric oh my god um, <laughs> and you know it to a point where you're like am i even going to be allowed to take this into yeah, the country yeah <laughs> but there is something so special about that and it, um you know you mentioned there are just some recipes that you can't touch now because of how they taste when your mom made them yeah. and is giving the saffron is that is a small yeah. act of generosity towards yeah. that making that meal yeah i absolutely love that poem and in writing the act dilemma what's an important lesson that you've learned about your own belonging i said this thing earlier about 
trying to rewrite the same poem until the poem's written. I feel like I thought about that a lot while writing the book as well. And I feel like what identity meant a decade ago it doesn't mean the same anymore the definition of identity and embracing different identities has changed so much and i have sort of this is like as a young woman who's lived in different cities i've written it in my voice but i've also i've found it hard to like strike a balance between how identity was perceived by my parents by my grandparents and how it is perceived by me i am that kind of person who doesn't get nostalgic for the past i don't believe in that sort of thing i feel like our present should be as good and i very strongly believe that i feel like if you're constantly living addressing a sense of nostalgia we are at a loss and i think that's what this these poems touch upon as well it's almost like if you were to live in this nostalgic mindset it prevents you from connecting with someone yeah. who's right there yeah. in front of you yeah and movement the place landscape it sort of establishes a disconnection on all levels and that really makes me very uncomfortable yeah when you move to an, a new place how do you go about charting a path or developing a sense of home in that new place I think it's been different for different cities I solely moved to Dublin to study Irish literature and I say this very shamelessly because I had a crush on Beckett when I moved to Dublin first I sort of tried to understand the city by its different writers and I sort of did a similar thing when I moved to Belfast as well I moved to Belfast to work on this book and uh i was also part of a creative writing masters program there so i was always around poems and those poems were sort of very integral in establishing that kinship with the city but also just knowing your way around the city walking walking lots and lots and lots is another element to it like you asked me about what home sounds like just trying to understand what the city sounds like bit by bit as days go on that is important i love that idea of um kinship with place that's very interesting and very positive way of looking at it it's almost like you're in relationship to the space yeah rather than just mere consequence but it's empowering because it makes you think i can impact a location and a place by engaging with the culture and by yeah. contributing to that Yeah, I say that because I've never had the luxury to live anywhere and just declare that the city is mine. I feel like I've always been at the sense of discomfort to claim that since my childhood or I've had to be open to the newness a city can bring to me or offer me. You mention a lot of authors and poets and artists throughout the act dilemma and is it's been described as you're reflecting on how that person might have perceived home and their yeah. sense of belonging and it's almost like you're kind of grabbing their hand across time and and like a tribe of mentors to mm -hmm. to guide you through this journey of discovering your belonging i i'm particularly interested in what drew you to Natalia Ginsburg what drew you to her work the first ever text i read by natalia ginsburg was the little virtues which is a slender collection of essays about humanity about our daily lives and about the little values that we carry on from one generation to another and that i read that a few years ago and then i have always reread it and i've gifted that book to in a to a lot of people who mean so much to me and then i went on to read her novels which talk about family history in a way that i hadn't encountered before i feel like the intimacy generation the intimacy between different generations and you know how skewed human relationships can get even if they're blood relations and 
how when historically you are living at such a sensitive time she's just a magical writer i can go on and on but like even like be it fiction non fiction i am more drawn to her non fiction this particular book which is most favorite of mine you know the little virtues and yeah it's just i feel like she's a very intuitive writer the facts are all out there and she addresses them but she doesn't create a fuss around them she talks it's very intuitive it's like boarding a train and not knowing where you get off that's what reading on Dalia Ginsburg essay is like that's one of my favorite books and i'll continue to read on in the years to come and it'll always be a new experience and a lot of her writing touches on that theme of exile as yeah, well yeah. um given her background you know um being of jewish descent and at that particularly um as you say sensitive time politically being an italian and also she talks about being in london feeling like yeah. a foreigner yeah she didn't like england much <laughs> <laughs> and she is always politically quite right <laughs> which is you know important <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. definitely what are some of your strongest memories of belonging or feeling like you belong i feel like whenever i encounter someone talking in punjabi outside india that movement means a lot to me it it really is a very special movement to me and yeah it stands out among all the other things that happen i'd love you to read sharing a bear with you oh yeah pandemic poem <laughs> Sharing a beer with you is an important vocation for me more important than reading shakespeare or not reading shakespeare more important than writing a poem so moving that when i read it to you standing at edinburgh castle arm in arm with you with only your eyes to look into overlooking the hazy realities of the city i would want the loneliest magpie to respond and i insist sharing a beer with you is more important than not writing the most moving poem of the universe because who am i to decrystallize honey that is not in our kitchen making strangers hearts quiver if i only care about one heart in the whole world which seems to be yours when frank o'hara said i look at you and i would rather look at you than all the portraits of the world I felt something in me soaring with the fury of an airplane looming up in the dusky cotton candy May sky. You know, don't you, that I would indeed look at you and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, partially because you are so dear to me, partially because I can care about fox turds in the garden with you with the same passion as the new Keynesian divine coincidence. or garcias divine providence both shielding us from the ongoing plague in different manners what good can dora mar or amrita shergill really do to my sensations when only looking at you can wow me like the sun's first ray after a blizzard or like dew's subtle touch on a leaf that is still an infant and now while the squirrels hop from one tree to another to meet an unknown lonely bird singing by herself i finished this poem sitting on the staircase as i look up pictures of adam smith's grave where we kiss to bring us some good fortune waiting for you and a beer chilling in the fridge that you will bring with all the love and luck that i need in this world thank you i often like to think of my identity as being culturally complex and uh, i i read it somewhere and i i feel awful i just can't seem to find who originally said that phrase but i found it very resonant because it's this acknowledgement that you're more than just what people perceive of you you are a collection of the allegiances and the connections that you've gathered over your life and this poem it's so beautiful and it reminds me of uh, the power of of love and that connection to someone and how it almost feels like a miracle when you find yeah. someone 
I feel like I wrote this poem feeling something similar. I love that Frank O'Hara poem, which comes on like later in the poem. And it was my attempt at archiving that miracle. <laughs> exactly. And because uh, it sometimes feels almost impossible to find people, not just partners, but friends, family, who can look at you and acknowledge you fully is who you are yeah not just one aspect of you yeah, but the I full agree. fullness yeah. of, of who yeah. you are yeah and different parts that make you up yeah and particularly vocation um, being a poet it's an important part of who you are sharing yeah. the yeah. works of other poets yeah <laughs> how has your experience in that way in that sort of identity how has that experience impacted your relationships or the way you hold yourself in life when you're growing up in a sick household, like giving up's not an option. So there's that aspect of it. But then also the lessons you learn on your own journey, which are not taught to you. So just live always like, you know, living in between places and living in between and uh, living in between so many languages. I think there's a sort of resilience that you acquire yourself on your own journey. And I don't think I would have been as resilient if I was only living in one city all these years or if I was only speaking one language in a certain way all those years. All these complexities sort of uh, contribute to that sense of resilience. Oh, and it's so important, that yeah. resilience, especially given how things are now. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought, yeah. As a, as a final question, what advice would you give to others who find themselves unsure of where they belong or how they fit in? I think it's a really tough journey to be on. It'll never be smooth enough, but we all have our own ways of exploring it. And I think the joy is in discovering that, that how can we we make other people comfortable but ourselves comfortable as well and we can create a safe space a sense of community a network where we feel like we are being look, looked after but we are also at the same time looking after people who are around us i think that is very important i couldn't agree more There's such human needs isn't it yeah. um, the need to be looked after yeah. and it often feels uh, when you are someone who is often at the margins or kind of navigating these these differences constantly, you are often negotiating to be looked after. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very important to be kind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And if someone wants to follow you and your work uh, and you're currently working on a new project, how can they find you? I have a website, which is my name, supriyakardhaliwal.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Supriya. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Zeno. To stay up to date with our monthly episodes, you can sign up to our newsletter at xenocast.org or follow us on Instagram at xeno_pod. Our theme music is composed by Alex Julian Edwards. <laughs>